Our world is constantly evolving. As time moves forward, things change, which is why it's important to stay informed. Throughout the year, there are dozens of professionals that share their expertise with the community through lectures sponsored by local government agencies and area not-for-profits. And each month, we'll feature one of these visiting professors as they discuss the latest current events and trends. So grab a notebook and pull up a chair because the lecture hall is about to begin. How's everybody doing today? I'm glad the rain didn't scare you away. That's good. I was driving over here thinking, it's, you know, but it's not that bad, really. Um, as Amanda was saying, my name is Cheryl. I'm from Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. And what we are more than anything is a hospital and a rehabilitation center. We actually see over 5,000 injured orphaned animals every single year. The ultimate goal is to get them back to the wild, but a lot of times it doesn't work out that way. We have probably over 400 animals that live at the sanctuary with us. You're welcome to come visit. We're open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 4.30. Um, we actually do, do presentations at the sanctuary every day as well. Um, today I'm here with you all though, and it's actually kind of neat because I live up in Port St. Lucie. So if you guys ever see me around, say hi. Um, and uh, maybe ask about the critters and see how they're doing. And I will let you know. Uh, what I'm going to basically do is bring them out one by one. I'm going to talk about them a little bit. I'm going to actually walk through and let you guys touch a couple of them if you want to. You may not want to touch what I bring around for you. That is for you to decide. I am very scared of a cockroach. Do you think I'm going to touch a cockroach? No, it's not going to happen. So if I walk by with something you don't want to touch, don't put your hands out. If it's something you don't want to see, close your eyes. It works really super good, okay? That's usually what I do when I see cockroaches and somehow they disappear and I don't know where they go. And the one wonderful thing about the cockroach is a lot of animals eat them, which is really good, yeah. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now at the very end, I'll, I'll, I'll do some questions and answers or answer you know, anything that you, pick my brain, feel free to pick my brain. Um, but I'm gonna kind of just bring them out one by one. If I ask you a question, you know the answer to it, just say it out loud. If I ask you to raise your hand, raise your hand. It's fairly simple. You guys ready? Are you sure? Yeah. All right. Let me go ahead and take my keys away here and this away. Now, this little first guy that I want to bring out, I brought him because he's so very, very cute and they're so neat to see and they're very important to know about and I know that you have them here at Oxbow so I thought it would be an important animal to bring out and it's probably one that you haven't seen that's this super tiny small Aww. look at the little bitty guy <laughs> so this little guy here I call him helmet and helmet is a very special little guy now we have turtles and we have tortoises right some live on land, some live in the water. This guy's got flipper feet. Where does he live? On the water. Water. Everybody says water. That's actually one of the biggest problems for this guy. This is actually a gopher tortoise. And the gopher tortoise cannot swim at all. This is a little tiny baby. He might be about a year old at this size right here. And he uses his flipper feet like shovels and he digs tunnels in the ground. And inside those tunnels, up to 70 different kinds of animals could be living inside the tunnels with them. So these guys are very important. They're actually building homes for other animals, which is very, very special. Now, these these guys are going around and eating plants and grasses and cactus flowers and things like that. But what they eat must come out and they sometimes go to the bathroom inside their tunnels, which is kind of gross, don't you think? Now can they go around with a little dustpan and pick up their mess? No, but you know what? There are some animals that like to eat poop. So those bugs will go inside those tunnels and they will clean up after the gopher tortoise and then there's other animals that like to eat the bugs and then other animals that like to eat what just ate the bugs. So all this really cool stuff happens underneath the ground inside their tunnels. This is a keystone species. This is a very important animal for all of us to know about. Now, a lot of people help turtles and tortoises across the road, which I think is fantastic, but we have to know what we're doing. Whichever direction they're going is they where they want to go. And a lot of people would see them walking towards, say, a school. There's woods, a lake, a big, beautiful tree on the other side. A lot of people say, oh, don't go to the school. Turn around, come over here. Big, beautiful tree. His home, his tunnel's probably behind the school. That's why he's walking that way. So they always know which way they want to go. So we help them cross in the way that they're going to go. And then when we set them down, they can choose if they want to stay on land. Do you think we should go to the side if there's a canal and say, swim, turtle, swim, and throw them in the water? No, because this guy can't swim, right? So it's really important that we help them across. We set them down. If they want to go in the water, they'll go in the water. If they want to stay on land, they're going to stay on land, but it's going to be their choice to make. Have you heard about a snapping turtle? 
A snapping turtle has the power when it bites to bite right through bone and take a finger off. So you have to know what kind of animal you're helping. Years ago, I helped a snapping a turtle across the road by getting my car mat out. I scooted him onto my car mat. I drug him across in the direction that he was traveling. I took my car mat back. He looked back at me. I looked at him. I was like, good job, buddy. Thank you so much for not hurting me. Didn't hurt him. But you know what? He went to the bathroom on my car mat. So when I got home, I had to clean up the car mat, which was fine. I didn't mind at all. Now, another really neat thing about turtles and tortoises, if you feel your fingernail and kind of rub on it, tap on it, our fingernails are made out of the same kind of stuff as their shells are. So even though it looks hard like a rock, they actually can feel just like you can feel when you touch your fingernail. So it's very important anytime you touch them, you're always very gentle. You never want to bang on them. You always want to be very gentle with them. I'm going to kind of buzz him around so you guys can see him up close. If you want to touch him, you may touch him. Little Helmet is a very excellent little tortoise. Aww. Isn't he cute? Now he came to our hospital because a big giant dog got a hold of him. And he wound up coming in and he had a couple little injuries on his, on his little feet and we were able to kind of fix him up. And uh, he now lives with a couple of our other little tiny little tortoises there. So he's got a couple of roommates, which is pretty nice. And what was his name? Helmet. Helmet. This is beautiful little Helmet. Wow. Isn't he super cute, that little? I see him out here all the time. Yeah. I've never seen one that small. Isn't he adorable being that small? Now you notice when they're small, they're light in color. They've got the light colors. As they start getting bigger, that lightness goes away and they're pretty well dark in color. So cute. Isn't he adorable? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I think he's a fantastic little guy. And it's kind of neat to see them this small. This year is actually, I've been at the sanctuary for a little over three years. This is the first year I've seen one this small. So Helmet's a very important, very special little guy. All right, we'll say goodbye to Helmet for the moment. Bye, Bye Helmet. Thank you very much. Sir, will he be able to be let go? We're hoping so. We just want to make sure that he gets a little bit bigger, you know, um, because since he was so tiny, and we'd like to put him back to the same area that he was in, but there's a lot of big dogs in that area. So we're kind of waiting to see what's going to wind up happening with him. All right. I think I need to bring out a furry little animal because that's kind of what this whole thing is about in a way, but I wanted to start out with the cutest little thing ever. So these guys here, I brought two because they like to hang out together. <sighs> now this is not an animal that you'll wind up seeing bouncing around in the wild in Florida. But actually, both of these ferrets came through our sanctuary because they were found running around in the wild in people's yards. Now, what winds up happening, and they're really, really good escape artists. This here is French vanilla, and this is little caramel. And I'm actually going to set little French vanilla back inside here for a moment. In you go, my dear. And I'm going to show you something really kind of cool, really kind of creepy. Caramel. All right, you watching? Boink, boink. They can twist, they can turn. Anything they can get their head through, they can get the rest of their body through. So this animal can actually escape through a very small, small area, which is a really big problem. People wind up getting them as pets. They sell them in the pet stores all the time. Notice nowadays they've got the top where you can't stick your fingers in there. That's because these guys are major biters when they first come into the pet stores. And when they bite, they do not let go, which is kind of a scary thing. They've got really super sharp teeth also. Now the ferret. Everybody thinks, look how cute, they're so fantastic. But the pet stores and stuff don't tell you what's really, really true about them. If they had a sign on the front of the cage saying, hi, we're from the skunk family, you think anybody would buy them? No. These guys are actually in the same family as the skunk. These guys are from the Mustelidae family. So they're a stinky little animal, which is a big problem because most people get them, they get them home and they realize, woo, no, what have I just done? My whole house smells like skunk. And that's because you got your cute little ferrets now. And your little ferret could be a major biter too. Now little caramel and French vanilla, they're used to being handled now, so they're actually pretty well behaved. Um, but they're very wiggly little guys. And they do get long claws. You have to keep their nails like trimmed down. Um, or they scratch a lot, which is a big problem. They're also thieves. They like to steal stuff and they love shiny stuff. So they take 
jewelry, they take car keys, they take all that and they go hide them somewhere. And then you're running around looking for your car keys and you don't know what you're doing. So then you find this really neat little place where all the ferrets have hidden their fun stuff and you realize, oh, this is their hiding spot. And you find all the stuff you've been missing. So realize. Now these guys, when they escape, they have a problem because they don't know what to eat out in the wild. This is basically a carnivore right here, but the domestic ferret that they sell in pet stores, these guys are basically from the European pole cat. These guys are not really related to our black-footed ferret. The black-footed ferret actually is a wild ferret. They live out in like Wyoming area out west and they strictly eat, their main diet is prairie dog. So they're a strict carnivore. They're going through the tunnels and eating on the prairie dogs. The domestic ferret needs to have people taking care of them. So when they escape and they wind up out in the wild, they literally wind up dying of starvation because nobody's there to take care of them. So these guys, when they came in, they were skin and bones. They were super skinny. They were not doing well. And we were able to obviously fatten them up and do a nice little job now. Um, I'm going to bring little caramel around. If you want to pet little caramel, you can see how soft they are. But just realize this is a stinky little animal. And when we go into the pet stores and we buy them in the pet stores, we wind up spending a lot of money because the ferrets will go anywhere between $100 to about $130. And then you have to get the cage, then you have to get the food. If you're really super nice, you'll wind up getting hammocks and toys and all this other stuff. So you wind up actually leaving there with a few hundred dollars in a bill. And then you get home and within the first probably hour, you're gonna be like, woo, what have I done? My house stinks. <laughs> and they're a fun little guy. And these guys actually have a very high metabolism. They're eating every couple of hours, which means they're going to the bathroom every couple of hours. Oh, okay. And they go in the corners. And when the one corner gets dirty, they decide, oh, I'm gonna go to a different corner because it's no dirty over here. Now I'm gonna go to a different little place. So these guys are actually a big problem for most people. Um, so if you guys decide that you wanna get any kind of different pets or anything like that, always do your own research because a lot of the pet stores are very helpful, but some of them are just thinking about the money part of things. And you see how wiggly this one is? Little wiggle worm. All right, we're gonna put you back in here with little French vanilla. In you go, my friend. Those are a couple of my little furry friends that I brought for you today. They're fun too. When they start bouncing around, they bounce all like sideways and kind of boing, boing, boing. They're a fun little animal to watch, but really very, very stinky. So be aware of that. All right. My next little guy I want to bring out here is a very, very special animal. We've got them all over Florida and it's super important to know about them. And you've probably seen them around. An alligator. Now this guy here, his name is Stanley. I'm going to take Stanley's little towel out just in case he decides to go potty. We're going to have it hit right there. So Stanley is about a year and a half to two years old at this size right here. Alligators and crocodiles, we're very special in Florida because we have both alligators and crocodiles. We're pretty much the only place that has both alligators and crocodiles. Alligators are mainly freshwater, lakes, rivers, canals, occasional swimming pools during a drought, be careful, okay? And then crocodiles are mainly salt or brackish water. And brackish is a mixture of salt and fresh, okay? So when you're looking at an alligator, an alligator has more of a rounded nose, kind of looks like a U. Crocodiles have more of a pointy nose, it looks more like a V. Alligators are born dark with light colored stripes. Crocodiles are the other way around. When they first come out of their eggs, they're only about five, six inches. They're super tiny little guys. Lots of animals like to eat baby alligators. Big fish will eat them, big birds will eat them, other alligators will eat them. So that's why they have their stripes when they're young. This helps them blend in. What's the big word for blending in? Camouflage. So they're really good at being able to blend in and camouflage into the grasses because lots of animals like to eat them. Now, they grow about a foot a year for the first six to eight years. Then they grow the rest of their lives at a much slower pace. I'm talking maybe an inch a year slow after that point, okay? To me, the most important thing to know about alligators and crocodiles, well, we have over a million and a half alligators in the state of Florida. About few hundred less than a thousand crocodile. Crocodile like ripping hot salt water, they're found more like Miami and south of here, where alligators are in South Florida, Central Florida, North Florida, into Mississippi, Louisiana, they're kind of all over the place. You shouldn't be close enough to see this. 
that if you are and you see their mouths closed. Alligators, you can only see the top row of teeth. It kind of looks like he's smiling at you. Crocodiles, you can see top and bottom. It looks like he's growling or snarling at you. To me, the most important thing to know about these guys is the fact that they can hold their breath under the water for well over an hour. So if you guys ever go somewhere and you see one go underneath the water and 15, 20 minutes goes by and you think, oh, he must have left, he could still be underneath that water for possibly over another hour. So be aware of that. If an alligator or crocodile ever comes up to you, is he coming up and say, hey, let's be friends? <laughs> no, he's coming up to you because he thinks you have food. That is an extra dangerous animal. I don't care what kind of wild animal comes up to you. That is not good. You need to get away from that wild animal, OK? Anything with a mouth can and will bite. That's one of the most important things to always remember. Touch the top of your head. Do we have eyes, ears, nose, anything like that on the top of our head? No. no, if we did, we'd look really silly. And we'd have to walk around like this to see where we're going. That wouldn't work out very well, would it? No, alligators and crocodiles have their eyes, ears, and nose on the tippy top of their head. That's so they could be floating in the water with just this coming up out of the water. The rest of the body is hiding. And they float along. And fish and birds and different animals think, oh, I wonder what's floating in the water. Let's go check it out. And they'll come up really, really close to the alligator. If he's hungry, what do you think happens? Chomp, reaches right out and grabs onto him. These guys are an ambush hunter. They would rather sit there, still as can be, wait for something to come close and then jump right out at it, okay? So they don't really like to chase their food down because that's way too much work. But you ever have one coming up to you, that's not good, okay? Now, I'm gonna bring him around for you guys to touch if you want to, okay? All the bumps on the top of their back onto their tail. Each bump is a piece of bone called a scoot. And as the alligator and the crocodiles grow, these bones grow on top of them too. So the top and the end of the tail is very hard, where the sides and the bottom are very, very soft. Those are their skin, okay? And I'm gonna talk more about them when I get back up here, but I want you guys to see them up close and personal. Give them a little touch, see what he feels like. He's a really, really well-behaved alligator. You can see that. Stanley has been going around into classrooms and stuff. Stanley's used to going into cafeterias with over 200 kindergartners screaming and yelling. So Stanley can handle all sorts of pretty cool stuff. Now Stanley came to us because he was confiscated by Florida Fish and Wildlife. Somebody had him illegally in their house and Stanley sees people as a food source. So that's why this guy is not able to get released back to the wild because as soon as he sees somebody, he actually comes right up to you, which is a big, big problem. Now, if you, when you see them up close, they do actually have ears. Right behind their eyes, they've got these little flaps and these are their ears right here. Okay, so they do hear. They have a very good sense of smell and they have little pits in the front of their nose that actually can feel movement. And to me, one of the coolest things about the alligators and the crocodiles, they have three eyelids. We have a top and a bottom. They have a third one that comes across sideways. It's called a nictitating membrane. It acts like goggles or a mask under the water. So they're able to put their goggles on under the water and it protects their eyes when they're swimming around, which is pretty neat. Now, sometimes Stanley will open his mouth for me. We'll see if he's in the mood to do it today. Oh, thank you, Stanley. Now, when he's got his mouth open, I'm going to scan him across so you guys can see. You'll see it's all sealed up in there. That's so alligators and the inside of a crocodile mouth kind of looks the same way. It's all sealed up. That's so they can open up their mouth underneath the water to grab a fish or a turtle or something that's under the water and no water goes inside their body. You may have seen a little line in the back of their throat. That's kind of like a little door. So he's able to open up his mouth, grab the fish, the turtle, whatever it is. No water goes in their body. He closes his mouth. Then he goes up and sticks his head out of the top of the water, opens his mouth, opens his little door, takes the fish in, seals it back up and goes right back down again. Pretty cool stuff. You guys ever need to do a research paper on an animal? Alligators and crocodiles have so much cool information about them. I could blab off for probably over an hour on these guys, but I'm not gonna do that to you, okay? So for now, we're gonna say, see you later, alligator. Hey, alligator. After a while, crocodile. <laughs> Bye, Stanley. Thanks, Stanley. You're a very good alligator, you are. All right, let's get you back inside. I'm actually gonna keep his towel out in case I need it for my next little animal. Now, I brought a very, very special bird with me. And this is one of my favorites. That would be awesome, but it's not a toucan. I've got to put a glove on to be able to protect my arm. She is a bird of prey. 
Birds of prey eat other animals, so they don't eat seeds and berries and stuff. So they've got really strong feet, really strong claws, they're called talons, that grab onto things. And they can go straight into skin, into bone. That's why we put a glove on to protect our arm. Pretty smart, right? Good idea. All right, so this is one of my beautiful favorite little friends here. Come here, baby. You step up. Come on. Come on, mama. <laughs> Come here. There we go. It's owl. Now, it's kind of funny that I would bring this kind of owl because if you look in the corners over here. Don't look, Oliver. <laughs> don't look over there. So this is Oliver. And Oliver, anybody know what kind of owl it is? What is it? Well, the barn owl has the heart-shaped face. It's very close. The barred owl. Barred owl. This is the barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D. Kind of looks like they have bars on the front of their chest. And Oliver came into our hospital because Oliver was attacked by another animal when she was a baby. And she's actually missing an entire right wing. Now, I'm going to kind of, in a sense, throw her off balance for a moment, just so you can see. Now, a bird like this, do you think she can go back to the wild and fly around? No. So she lives with us at the sanctuary, and Oliver goes around and teaches people about owls and birds of prey. Now, in Florida, we've got five different kinds of owls that usually visit Florida. We've got this one, the barred owl. We've got the barn owl with the heart-shaped face. We've got the great horned owl. That's the biggest owl we have. The smallest owl is called a screech owl. He's only about this big, and he looks like a miniature great horned owl. And the screech owl's pretty neat. He's a good little guy, and they're all over the place. They probably got them all. You got them. Oh, we got one over there. Don't look, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got the bird owl, which is the little owl that likes to be in the ground, which will also go into the gopher tortoise burrows with them, which is kind of cool, too. Now, owls. One of the coolest things about the owls is the way they can turn their head, yes? If you keep your body still, don't move your body at all. No cheating, OK? Turn your head as far as you can one way and then bring it back. If we were an owl, we would be able to turn our head all the way around without moving our body, look straight behind us, then keep going over the other shoulder. It's about 270 degrees one way. Flip it around, go the other way about 270 degrees, and they can flip their head back and look at their back. That's pretty awesome. We can't do that, can we? Now, I look at an owl. It doesn't look like it has a neck but they actually have a bigger neck than we do. If you feel the bones behind your, your head, you feel back, all those bumps, those are our bones. We have seven of them. Owls have 14 of them, so they have twice as many as we do. That's why they're able to turn their head like that. Now, it's hard to see with her eyes because she has dark eyes, but they're not able to move their eyes in their skull. If we keep our head still, we can look up and down and side to side and wiggle, wiggle our eyeballs. They can't do that. Their eyes are stuck in their head, always looking forward. So when they want to look around, they have to turn their whole head around and look around. Now, Oliver sometimes talks for us. Are you going to talk? You going to talk, Ollie? Ollie, Oliver. Now, I'm not very good at it, but I'm going to try to try to get her going if I can. They make a really cool sound. And like I said, I'm not good at it because I'm a person. She's owl. Ooh, 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 ooh. Whenever you hear that kind of sound, that's coming from this type of owl. Each owl has their own sounds, their own like language. That's so they can talk to each other's kinds. Now, you guys make, a, make owl sound. <laughs> there you go. The basic hoot sound, that's your great horned owl. So when you guys hear just the basic kind of hoot out there, that's your great horned owl. When you hear the pretty little song, that's going to be this type of owl right here. Now, Oliver does sometimes talk, but I guess Oliver's maybe TV shy. Are you TV shy today? You got nothing for me? Do you want me to play it I don't know. Actually, sometimes when I put her in the kennel, she winds up going off. So we'll try putting her in array. If anything, we'll take her out after, and we'll see if she winds up talking then. Because she might be so stimulated with all the different things going on around here, too, in the tanks and stuff. What do you think, beautiful girly? You're so pretty. All right. Good job, Ollie. We'll see if you'll talk when you go back inside here. 
You gonna talk for us? And maybe we'll try that after, because who knows, maybe she would. Good girl. You ready? You gotta close your wing. Silly girl. You hop in. You gonna talk? Huh? You got nothing to say, Oliver? Do it. Come on. No. Maybe if I lift you up here. Come on, Ollie. Oliver, you gonna talk for us? Come on, Ollie. No? <laughs> She's actually looking up there. <laughs> All right. We'll see. We'll see. She might just change her mind. We're going to go ahead and turn her around this way. That way you guys can see her. If she does start talking, it's kind of a neat thing. What do you think, Ollie? We're going to turn you around so you can see everybody. I think it's time for another furry animal. <sighs> furry. furry, I know. So, when I first started at the sanctuary, this was one of the most feared animals at the sanctuary. This animal bit everybody. Basically, everybody was scared of it. I took it on as a project because I've worked with this type of animal down in Miami before, so I have a little bit of kind of experience with them. So I took him on as a project. And now, after three years of working with him, he's one of the sweetest things ever. Oh, are you sleeping? Wake up. Wake up, beautiful. Wake up, my beautiful handsome. A skunk. A skunk. Ha, ha, ha. You want to smell? You want to smell? No. You think I'd bring a loaded skunk? No. Now this little guy here, his name is Willie. Hi, Willie. Say hi to Willie. Willie, Willie, Willie. Now Willie, like I said, when I first started there, this was an animal that everybody said, stay away from Willie. And I was like, well, what is Willie? I thought he would be a bobcat or a Florida panther. They say, oh no, he's a skunk. I said, skunk? You're scared of the skunk? <gasps> I walked in there. This guy charged me, stomping his feet, mouth wide open, and I backed right back out. I was like, wow, he is kind of nutty. And I just took him on as a project. It took me probably four to six months of working with this animal every day to get him to the point where he would trust me. And then I started realizing that his left eye never developed. He's completely blind on the left side. So I think that's one of the reasons why he was such a mean little skunk, because nobody understood that. He was actually sold in an exotic pet store. In exotic pet stores, they sell skunks. And when they sell the skunks, they give them an operation. They descent them. They take the gland out so they can't spray anymore. Awesome! Safe skunk. No. Even though they're, they're descented and they can't spray, they still smell really bad. They have an odor in their skin and their oils and their body. When they go to the bathroom, it smells just like skunk spray, just like your ferrets. So these guys are a stinky, stinky little animal. They're also nocturnal. Right now he's sleepy time. This is sleepy time. He wakes up at night and wreaks havoc around everywhere. So these guys, to me, I don't think any wild animals should be in the pet trade. I think they should all be out in the wild doing whatever they want. I find it very sad that Willie is not out in the woods having a family and doing what he's supposed to be doing. I find it very sad that pretty much all these animals are here with us, except for like Oliver. Oliver obviously can't go back to the wild, missing a wing and all. Um, the thing to really know about skunks in Florida is we have two kinds of skunks in Florida. We have this kind, this is your striped skunk. We also have a skunk called a spotted skunk that lives by the beach. If you're at the beach, you see a very small black and white animal. It's got stripes, spots, no bigger than a squirrel, very short fur. It's not a funny looking kitten, okay? That is a skunk. Skunks, when they spray, can spray over 10 feet away. So like from here to that wall, he'd be able to spray that far. When they spray, they're a thinking animal. They're thinking, hmm, do I want to spray one or do I want to spray everyone? They can actually control where they spray, they can aim, and they can control if a stream comes out or a puffy, stinky cloud for all of us. So if you get sprayed by a skunk, what kind of, what kind of bath do you take? 
Tomato, tomato, long one. That's a good one. A tomato juice bath. That's what everybody thinks. But the problem is that tomato juice is water-based. Skunk spray is oil-based. Oil and water don't mix. You're going to smell like a rotten tomato skunk. You're still going to smell like a skunk, though. A lot of times when animals get sprayed, dogs, cats, what have you, it's only on their fur, and there's different things you can do to get it off their pur fur. But for people, when we get sprayed, it absorbs into our skin. Our skin drinks it. Think about when you put lotion on or sunscreen on your skin, drinks it. It becomes a part of you. So it actually gets into your body and it takes your body to filter it out. It could take two to six weeks. Ooh, that's a long time to smell really bad. Every time you sweat, every time you shower, every time you bump into something, that smell comes rolling out of your body. Not something you want to experience. But skunks are a cool enough animal to give us warnings before they spray. The little striped skunk like Willie, he'll take his little front feet and he'll stomp his feet at you, try to scare you wet. If that doesn't work, let me get him like this. He'll lift his tail up really big like a flag, open it up and wave it around. If that doesn't work, I think they laugh first, but they turn around, they look right over their shoulder, they aim and they shoot their stinky stuff. Now the little beach spotted skunk, he's super cool. He stomps his feet, then he goes into a handstand to look taller and sprays right out of the handstand. So if you're ever at the beach and you see that little animal come out, there's a lot of people that are at the beaches and stuff that are actually feeding them. So even though they're a nocturnal, nocturnal animal, they a lot of times are coming out two people at the beach, so be aware of that. Get away from that animal, okay? Now I'm gonna bring my beautiful Willie around for you guys to pet if you want. You can give him a nice soft little pet on the back. You'll see he's so fluffy and he's so soft. And he's, he's a very handsome little little skunk, I must say. Aww. Isn't he awesome? Oh, he's, so soft. he's very soft. Are you clever in your nose? That's <laughs> cute. <laughs> Isn't he fantastic? Beautiful, handsome William. So Willie, I started calling him William. I sometimes call him Sir William, and I have had people bow to this animal right here, which is pretty funny to see. Isn't that neat to have somebody bow to a skunk? I think it's great. Isn't he beautiful? He's a really good looking little skunk. And he used to be such a wiggle worm and so mean. And look at him now. He's just sitting there like, yep, yeah, I'm hanging out on my log, hanging out with mom. So you'll notice they've got their long claws. Those are for digging. They dig up bugs and grubs and worms and different things in the ground. So they're digging up all sorts of stuff. What do you think, Willie? You want to go back to bed? Should we say good night to him? Good night, Willie. Good job, my friend. In you go. He was in a little ball in here, too. He was all comfy cozy. Good job, my friend. All right. Now, I have an animal hidden around the corner over here. I think it's time to break him out. What are you doing? Ha, are you dancing? Are you dancing? You step up. He's dancing. He's dancing over here. Uh, a parrot. Oh, a parrot. <laughs> So we saw a bird of prey. That was our owl. And the parrots, these guys, do you think these guys eat animals? No. No, these guys are eating seeds and berries and fruits and yummy things like that. Now, parrots are a really, really neat animal. I love to work with them, but I would never have this animal in my house. I will tell you that right now. I love you, buddy, but no. His name is Buddy. I sometimes call him Bud. And he actually says, hey, Bud. And he says all sorts of stuff, but he only talks when he wants to. We can't make him talk. He does whatever he wants to. He says, hello. He says, hola. He says, what are you doing? My favorite thing that he says is, where are you going? I think it's very funny when he's like, where are you going? Because I tell him. I'm like, oh, I'm going right over here. I'm going to go do this or that. So I talk to him. I think he looks at me like I'm a bird brain, but whatever. Um, Parrots, depending on what type of parrot, okay, this is a macaw. This is called a blue and gold macaw. And some parrots are super tiny, some parrots are really bigger than him. Some of them can live over 80 years old. Oh, all right, good job. Now I can walk around. <laughs> I was waiting for that. That way I would be able to walk around. So this guy here, this blue and gold macaw, he could probably live to be close to 80 years old. That's a very, very long lifespan. Now in the wild, these guys live with hundreds, thousands of their own kind. 
which is pretty neat. Very loud, very loud animal right here. But they're a social animal. They like to be around others. And what's sad is most of the time when people get them as pets, they wind up by themselves. Sometimes they only wind up with like a friend. We've tried to get Buddy a friend and he does not want to be around another bird. This guy's about 17, 18 years old right now and he's never been around other birds and he was born and raised in captivity so he's never been out in the wild either and they like to talk to each other they like to communicate with each other so i find it very sad that these birds wind up being by themselves most of their life birds are meant to fly birds are meant to fly and most parrots don't ever get a chance to fly they wind up stuck in a cage all their lives you think that's fun no way parrots are meant to fly birds are meant to fly these guys are very messy too. When they go to the bathroom, it's like wet pancake batter. It kind of splatters all over the place. That's why I did it on the towel over here so it wouldn't splatter on the table. Good job, right? Yeah, yeah. And then when these guys bite, they can bite through. There's a very dark nut called a Brazil nut. And they're super hard to crack open. You have to get a nutcracker and use all your strength. These guys can go bink and break it right open with one quick little bite. I have seen him bite through a two by four, which is wood that's about this thick, take a chunk out of a two by four with one quick little bite. So if he could do that to a two by four, what do you think he could do to a finger if he really wanted to? Bink, probably take it right off, go right through bone. So if you guys ever go to a pet store, you go to somebody's house and they have a parrot in a cage, do not stick your hands in that cage. Even if the bird's like, huh? and being all friendly with you. Sometimes they're all friendly with you so you get really close and then they can bite you. So it's not something you ever want to have happen. Be very, very careful, okay? Now what I'm going to do with him is I'm going to kind of let him walk around on this table right here. You step up. Good boy. And you can kind of hang out while I bring on another animal. What do you think, buddy? Just make sure you guys don't try to touch him or anything. Um, of all the people that work and volunteer at the sanctuary, there's only three of us that can handle this bird right here. And I actually do have a wooden stick outside the door here just in case he wasn't cooperating, he'd step up on the stick for me. Because you think I'm going to have him bite me? Yeah. No way. I like to keep all my fingers as much as I can anyway. All right. Now, let's see who else I have. I'm going to leave my girl for the very end. So... A lot of people are very afraid of this animal here. Any idea what it might be? Super afraid of them. Snake. I'm going to bring out a really pretty snake. Now, I told you guys I'm scared to death of cockroaches. I'm not very comfortable with snakes. But the snakes that I work with, I'm very comfortable with them because I know them. This is my friend right here. Now this one here is very, very beautiful. First off, it's in a really pretty little pillowcase. We travel with our snakes in pillowcases because snakes are really good escape artists. We don't want any of our snakes escaping, especially one like this, because this one has no camouflage. It would get eaten really quickly. And then snakes like to hide under things and behind things, so it makes them feel a little bit more comfortable in here, bless you. And when we travel in the van, the air conditioning's on, so it helps keep them warmer inside here. Now being a pillowcase, do you think you can breathe in here? Do you ever get in bed and put the sheet over your head and hide? I still do it. It gets hot under there, but you can breathe under a sheet. That's why we use a pillowcase. If this were a garbage bag, would the snake be able to breathe? No. That's why we use a pillowcase. Now, this one here, anybody not comfortable with snakes? Yeah. There's always, there's always. I'm right there with you, really. But this one here, you'll see, is absolutely beautiful, first off, and so super nice. This is Sweet Potato. And Sweet Potato, why do we name him Sweet Potato? Because of the colors. Sweet Potato is a beautiful little snake. Anybody know what kind of snake it is? Tell me. The corn snake or the red rat snake. But this one is special. I brought it because I know you guys have the red rat over there. I wanted you to see a different type of color of the red rat. This is an albino. It actually does have red eyes. Now this snake right here, this snake was actually somebody's pet. The boy went off to college. Mom didn't want to take care of it anymore. So we wound up adopting sweet potato because this is such a nice snake. Now the red rat snakes usually are the, the color that's inside over there. The, kind of like the dark reds with the browns, the blacks. Sometimes when you're by the beach, they're more of a orange with tan, kind of light brown color. But they always have the same type of pattern. Now you've heard about the rattlesnake, right? 
A rattlesnake's a venomous snake and bite you once and kill you. Do you think this is a venomous snake? No way. <laughs> I would never handle a venomous snake first off, and I certainly would never bring a venomous snake around people like this. Now the red rat snake's one of the coolest snakes because many different reasons really, but they love to climb trees. And most snakes have to go from branch to branch to branch to get up there. The red rat snake can actually go straight up a pine tree, which is pretty neat to be able to see. Now they look kind of kind of slimy, they look kind of wet because they're so shiny, but they're not. Every time they eat something really, really big, they shed their skin. They get brand new skin all the time. If we got brand new skin all the time, we'd be looking pretty shiny and new also, yes? Yes, so that's why they look so shiny. Now, the thing that really creeps me out about snakes, and I can't really get over it, they cannot close their eyes. They don't have eyelids. So we can close our eyes and when we go to sleep, we can blink. They cannot do that. Their eyes are always open. They're always staring at you no matter what. I find that creepy. Okay. Now they do have a really cool clear scale that grows over their eyes. So their eyes are protected when they go through grass and things like that. When they shed their skin, that eye scale comes off. So if you ever wind up finding a snake skin, look at it. It's really neat to see the head part. You see the little eye scale. What's he doing when he sticks his tongue out? He smells something. Smelling and tasting. Now, we have taste buds. We have to put food or drink in our mouth for our brain to tell us that we just had fruit punch or pizza. That's how we work. Snakes have something on the top of their mouth called a Jacobson's organ that connects to their brain and tells their brain what they just tasted. That's why a snake's tongue is split at the end, so they can taste in two different directions. So it's actually pretty neat when you think about it. They stick their tongue out, they bring it back in their mouth, and their brain tells them which, which goes which way. So if a mouse went that way and a person went that way, which way is it going to go? He's going to go to the mouse. Now we've got some pretty special snakes. We've got a king snake that's over there. The king snakes are really cool. Do you think they're venomous? No, no non-venomous snake. They love to eat other snakes. And the king snake can eat venomous snakes. So the king snake could actually eat a rattlesnake. Ha! Yay! Pretty cool, right? So we've got some really good snakes in Florida. Now it's very important, the only time you guys should ever be around snakes like this is if somebody like me, Miss Amanda has one, says it's a really nice snake, something like that. Other than that, you stay away from it. In Florida, most of our snakes are non-venomous, like your rat snakes. But we do have rattlesnake, we do have coral snake, we have the cottonmouth, which is also the water moccasin. We have venomous snakes. Now it's kind of scary to know this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Florida Fish and Wildlife works with Bush Wildlife Sanctuary all the time because we are a wildlife sanctuary and we do what we do. Florida Fish and Wildlife confiscated an Egyptian cobra from somebody's garage in South Florida. Is there supposed to be an Egyptian cobra in Florida? No. no. What if that snake had escaped that garage? Where would it be? No. Who knows? Out in the wild somewhere. So as far as I'm concerned, now we're 2013. We don't know what's out there anymore, okay? Stay away from all of it. Now, have you heard about the python problems that we have in Florida? Are we supposed to have python in Florida? No, that's thanks to our exotic pet trade, okay? Now, some of them were people's pets that they let go. Some of them, Hurricane Andrew came through in 1992 and wiped out a Burmese python breeding facility where almost 2,000 snakes escaped right then. So. All sorts of different reasons how they got out there, but the reality is they are out there. So we want to stay away from them. Are you stretching? You're so beautiful, buddy. All right, so I'm going to bring sweet potato around. If you want to touch sweet potato, the proper way to touch a snake is to pet down the body of the snake because of the way the scales are, that's what feels good to them. Now, depending on what kind of snake you touch, depending on their scales, sometimes they feel kind of bumpy. Sometimes they're more smooth. To me, they kind of feel like a vinyl card seat. They kind of feel super fake. They feel, they feel fake. It feels fake, right? But you see it moving around, right? Sweet potatoes, super alive. Yeah. Now they're cold-blooded. What does that mean? Who knows what cold-blooded means? It means you're cold. It means you're cold. There you go. Whatever the air temperature is, is going to be the temperature of your body. So if it's very cold outside, what's your body going to be? Very cold. If it's very hot outside, what's your body going to be? Hot. So if I were a cold-blooded animal and I were very, very hot, how would I cool myself down? 
what would I do? How am I going to cool my, turn on the air? That's an excellent idea. But a little difficult to do, especially if you don't have fingers and stuff. So maybe I would go into the water to cool down. Maybe I would wind up going under a shade tree. Maybe I'd go underneath the ground into a gopher tortoise burrow to cool down. If I were very cold, how do I warm myself up? You put a coat on. I put a coat on. That would be awesome. But if I'm a snake, I might have a hard time getting my arms and my legs in a coat, don't you think? Yeah. What should I do? Snuggle. Snuggle, that's another good one too. Lay in the sun. I'm going to lay in the sun. I'm going to bake myself in the sun. That's how I'm going to warm my body up. So that's how they wind up warming their body up or cooling their body down. I like the fact that we're warm blooded and we need to put coats on and stuff like that. We don't have to worry about um, the cold blooded animals like these guys. All right, shall we say goodbye to Sweet Potato? Yes, yeah. Bye. Can Sweet Potato hear you? Yeah. Yeah. Do snakes have ears? No. Yeah, not really. They can't really hear the words that we say, but they can actually feel vibration. So when they're on the ground, like in the grass, and you're walking by, they can actually feel the ground move. So a lot of times, if you are walking on a path and there's a snake there, if you stomp really hard, oops, sorry, buddy. If you stomp really hard on the ground, a lot of times that's enough to scare that snake away. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. Oh, uh-oh, buddy got the floor. Oops. <laughs> All right. Good thing we have a little a little diaper towel right here, isn't it? All right. So in we go, sweet potato. Now, the last animal that I have to bring out is one that I brought from my house. This is one of my personal animals, and this is not what I would consider to be a good pet, okay? Because I know, but you know what? What goes in must come out. So they don't know they should wait to go to the bathroom. Um, so this last animal is very, very special to me. She came into the hospital um, at Bush Wildlife probably about a year and a half ago. And she was basically escaped or somebody just let her go, I don't know, and wound up in somebody's backyard. And because she looks different, Bush Wildlife wasn't gonna keep her, so she needed to have a home. And I have all my permits and everything at my house, so I can legally have certain types of wildlife and everything at my house. And this is not an animal that can go back to the wild. So I decided to adopt her. And she has never even been, besides the one day that she was at Bush Wildlife Sanctuary, she's never gone there and done shows or anything because she's not very comfortable with audiences and stuff. And since she lives with me at my house, I don't make her go through all that, okay? These guys are all used to doing that because this is what they do. This little one right here doesn't do that, but I brought her today for you all to see because she's very, very beautiful. She's very, very special, and she's super cool to see. Aww. Do you know what she is? A parrot. A parrot? A parrot? Like Who does she kind of look like? Kind of looks like right. Willie. This is a, she's not a true albino because she doesn't have white eyes. She's got dark eyes. It's called being leucistic. So this skunk, she is actually a skunk even though she's all white like this. Isn't she super pretty? Yeah. yeah, she's a pretty little girl. Her name is Pearl and Pearl lives at my house with me and Pearl's got a really fun life over there. And uh, my cats were not very happy when I first brought her home, but my cats have decided that they actually like her, and now they all kind of play together and snuggle together and stuff. Aww. So it's kind of funny to see a little white skunk running around with a bunch of cats. Um, but she has a really nice time. So I wanted to bring her for you guys to see today. Um, she's very, very sweet. I'm going to bring her around. If you guys want to pet her, you may pet her. The same information for, for Willie kind of goes with Pearl as far as the skunk information. So I'm not going to go blabbing off about skunks again because we already did that, didn't we? Isn't she soft? Isn't she beautiful? Now Pearl's got a little bit of a strange color. In the pet stores, they actually wind up breeding weird colors. They're breeding like apricot colors and stuff like that. We are messing around with nature so bad. Um, they are now breeding rat snakes to be like a lavender kind of purple color and stuff like that. We really are kind of messing around. And uh, I think we need to let, let nature do its thing and not have, you know. In the wild, maybe one in a million might be born albino. Um, isn't she beautiful? Now, you want to pet her again? Do you want to pet her? Yeah. Beautiful girly. Do you guys want to pet my pearl? My beautiful little pearly. Isn't she pretty? 
she's really soft. Isn't she? And she's so pretty. She's so, she's so different looking. She's a little superstar. She's a little superstar. Yeah. Was that fun, you guys? Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed yourselves. I'm going to go ahead and put Miss Pearl back in here. And then if any of you guys have any questions, say bye to Pearl. Bye, Pearl. Bye, Pearl. Thank you, Pearly. <laughs> you know what she loves to eat? Crickets. Yeah. I know, but she loves them. That's one of her favorite little treats is crickets. Ew. I know. So you guys, if any of you ever want to come by Bush Wildlife Sanctuary, like I said, we're open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 4, or 10 to 4.30. Um, we also do take volunteers. So if you guys ever want to volunteer your time, come on down, work with the animals and stuff, come on down. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. When you come there, you may notice that there's no set admission to get in. The way we survive is through donations. So you'll see donation boxes all around, drop some money in there. Um, at, we have a really nice gift shop. Any monies you spend in the gift shop, 100% of the proceeds go back to the animals. I actually try to do all my holiday shopping and everything out of that gift shop because I know it all comes back to our critters. Good? All right. You guys glad you came out today? Yeah. Thank you for braving the weather. Excellent job. If any of you guys have any questions or anything, I'll hang out for a little bit and answer some questions and all. Uh, I am going to go ahead and wind up putting Buddy back in. You step up. You going to step up for me? No. <laughs> silly. You're my silly boy. You going to step up? You going to make me show them? You're going you're gonna to make me get the wooden thing? All right, that's fine. We've got, we've got the little trick of the trade right here. You step up. Thank you, sir. You step up. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Shall we say goodbye to Buddy? Bye, Buddy. Bye, Buddy. Thank you, Buddy. All right, good job. In you go.